Schulz and Harald. Thank you. No. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention uh, this morning. Um, first of all, there should be a, for um, a, comp a companion to each talk is a is is like a wall with questions, like, and this beamer should project it to this wall. So if some questions come up, I guess some guy will be you. You will do this. I don't no, know. I, don't know. Okay. I just need okay. some power. For yeah. The okay. So in so. A few minutes. So just, uh, just, just for the for the program, mm -hmm. yeah. that there will be a, a war with questions, and after each talk, I think the speakers okay. can answer those questions. Yeah. I'm not sure, really sure, but for those who have the Android app installed, you will find on the bottom a notification, feedback and questions. You click on it, and you will get to this mobile website. For those who don't have it, once the beam is working, it will show the the, the URL, which is something in the yeah, too long, let's see. Yeah, it's, it, it has a number inside, so. <laughs> okay, so until uh, the Beamer is working, I, I suggest we just uh, start off right away, uh, so we don't waste too much time. So we are here uh, today uh, representing Bitcoin Austria, so we are um, uh, a Verein, a non-profit organization in Austria, which is uh, proliferating Bitcoin. And as such, we are doing uh, some little and larger projects uh, uh, with Bitcoin. And in case, uh, I just uh, want to ask, uh, who of you have heard of Bitcoin rudimentarily in any, in any shape or form? Okay, so almost the majority. And uh, so I will just uh, briefly explain what Bitcoin is. Uh, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a, in an experimental new digital currency that enables instant payments to anyone anywhere in the world. It uses peer-to-peer -peer -peer technology, it has no central authority, and managing transactions and issuing money are carried out collectively by the network. So it's something very different. It's both a currency and it's a transaction network. So uh, the, the two functions of this system tied together very uh, tightly so there is uh, you cannot explain Bitcoin in, in, in one talk uh, completely because it's a very complex topic and a lot of uh, a lot of the technologies that are used in Bitcoin have only emerged in the last 10 years that were invented now and they were all put together uh, to enable the Bitcoin network so uh, using Bitcoin you have a lot of responsibility but uh, your possibilities are all also very Big. So you are your own bank, so you are responsible for your own money, for your own safety. You have to keep your private keys. If you lose your private keys, there is nobody who can help you. So you have to be sure what you are doing. <laughs> in the future, or even now, there are services which help you in that. But in some cases, you have to give up some responsibility for that too. So that's something you can do. If yeah, you it's, it's a certain yeah. kind of trade-off you yeah. have to decide. So with, uh, either... You, you make it. You go the easy way and give away uh, and, and use some trust, and you have to trust some services, or you do it on your own and you know what what will happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Bitcoin is worldwide used worldwide. So there is no uh, trade regulations for Bitcoin. You can use it anywhere in Iran. In uh, yeah, where the, where the internet. Where, is the, where there is internet, of course, or yeah. any kind of communication is is okay. It's uh, instant almost. Uh, so there is a peer-to-peer -peer network which is constantly broadcasting transactions over the network. If you have any questions about specific terms I'm using, just uh, don't hesitate, just interrupt me. Uh, maybe I forgot to... Yeah. And charge picks are impossible. This is uh, something that's very important, especially compared to the whole traditional banking infrastructure. If you are operating any kind of a merchant service, you know that having chargeback is a big hassle. So. Um, this is removed, so... And, and, and especially if you're trading virtual goods. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And uh, this is also the, 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 the distinction that you don't need to care about any terms of services. You don't have any contract with anyone when you are doing Bitcoin transactions, when you are using Bitcoin uh, as a merchant uh, or in any application or whatsoever. So you are not dependent on App Store policies, on, on PayPal uh, uh, terms of use or whatever. 
Okay. okay. Next. So, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if this sounds a little bit scared to you, um, there are there's also a list of third-party services. So what we will show you is the actual API to use it with the uh, Java with a Java library. But for example, um, there is just a web API, a REST API from blockchain.info where you can interface with the Bitcoin network without having to manage every, anything. And there are also solutions like plugins for OpenCard by Paceus or BitPay. So they handle the actual payment and uh, also the conversion between Bitcoins and Euros or Dollars for you. So they can already do everything you want. And yeah, WalletBit is a point of sale solution if you are working on a device like on, at, at a checkout counter with real people, they already have solutions based on iOS, I think. Okay, so what, what type of clients are there? There's one so-called classical Satoshi client. This is the one which has been developed first. And this is all, also the client which um, um, manages the entire network and consists of the, of the, well, of the validation of all the transactions and and the core system, but there are also other alternatives because Bitcoin in itself is just a network protocol and so you can reduce all the burden of managing all and verifying all the transactions down to just the important transactions that are interesting for you from, for your trades and you can leave out all the verification. And so the library we will show you is called Bitcoin J and this is just a standard Java library for Java development and also for Android, and there are also many forms and alternative implementations. Yeah, maybe <coughs> you can say uh, something about about these uh, different clients. So they all serve a specific purpose. If you are not sure what uh, what client to use, you just you should uh, look at your use case, what you are doing with Bitcoin. So if you're just using it as a standard consumer, you just um, get some bitcoins and spend some bitcoins then on the desktop there is the, the multi-bit client uh, and if you are uh, really into bitcoin and use it for programming on low level stuff you need the, the full-blown client of course and if you're on android uh, you use a bitcoin j library and uh, there is also i don't know do we have a slide on this i think so on what? the on the specific clients no, i'm not yeah. i don't know <laughs> I, I think we have but uh, there is the, the Bitcoin wallet for Android, which depends on Bitcoin J. And so the main differences, uh, besides the functionality, is the resource uh, consumption of these clients. So the Satoshi client is very resource hungry. It uses a lot of CPU power and, uh, and the disk is also heavily used. So the disk I.O. is usually the bottleneck for, for the Satoshi client right now. This will change in the near future, but uh, right now it's the disk I.O. and it uses for uh, almost five gigabytes of storage on your local computer. If you're using the multi-bit client, which is all, uh, for normal consumers uh, very suitable, it only uses 21 megabyte because it uses compressed headers. And uh, Bitcoin J and Android is only five megabytes in a typical use case. There are other use cases where it's uh, a little bit yeah. bigger. So, so here it additionally filters out everything you are not supposed to know about. Yeah. So it's, the, the question no, is if you want to take care of only your info about your money or if you want to know the whole info about the whole network. So the whole network has right now about 5 gigabytes of transaction data inside. Okay, is this the slide you were talking about? Yeah. Okay, so, so this is applications of Bitcoin J. Uh, yeah. The yeah. And so this is the um, Bitcoin wallet for Android. Um, then this multi-bit client and then web service uh, web services like um, Satoshi Dice, which is a game, and I don't know. Yeah. You, the, you wrote is, there also many yeah. others. So it's very easy to write Bitcoin J applications to just depend on Bitcoin J. I will show you how to do it. Um, and uh, so there are ma many of the little projects, or if you just start up a little project uh, on your desktop or on Android, then you just pull in the, the Bitcoin J library and, and use it. And we will show you how to do that, how to uh, accept money uh, in your application, for example. <coughs> so, okay, now about the Bitcoin J project in itself? Yeah, so the Bitcoin J project is a 20% project. It is mostly maintained from by uh, Mike Hearn from Google. 
So he, he uses it, um, I, think, uh, I think you're familiar with the 20% concept at Google. Um, and there are also other contributors, uh, Miron Kupperman, Matt Corello, and uh, also other developers who are uh, using the Bitcoin J library, such as uh, the Multibit offer or the Bitcoin wallet for Android offer. And it is currently in, uh, in development, so it's uh, in alpha stage, but it's very much usable. It will not kill your computer or eat your money or anything, but it, it's certain that the API will change in the future because it's still emerging as such. So the goals of the, the Bitcoin J project is that it provides a, a Java implementation for the Bitcoin protocol. It's, uh, you are able to do a lightweight a Bitcoin client on the Android ecosystem and uh, you can use it also on the desktop or on the server. So the, 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 the reason for the Java implementation is the, the main client is a C++ implementation and it's in a very um, harsh environment. So you are on the network, on the open network, you have open ports, you announce services to, to the internet and there is a monetary incentive to hack you. Yeah? So, so some, there are hackers out there all the time which try to break into your client and into your application. And the C++ application um, is usually very well written, but of course uh, it's not the most, uh, let's say, security aware language uh, or environment. So it's very good to have a, a many alternative implementations. So in case there is a serious error with one, people can switch over with their services to alternative implementations. Yeah, and uh, so maybe you can continue. Um, so, so the, the main features, it is a little bit of rep repetition, but um, first of all, to interface with the network, you need some, you need a so-called wallet. And a wallet is basically a collection of your private keys. Um, you can think of this like a file stored on your system, which should be, um, which is basically the most important part. Um, of everything you are doing, okay? And so there is a management for this wallet, like create a wallet, store some keys inside, ask for the keys that are available, extract them and do queries on them, okay? So that's the next main feature is to connect to the Bitcoin network. So um, there are basically two steps. The first step is you have to bootstrap it by some, that there are uh, one, one way is to ask a DNS server, I think and the other way is to, to go on an ISC channel and then you get IP addresses and ports of existing nodes in the network which are running for a longer time and which are quite reliable and this is for bootstrapping the connection to the network and then when you have one or two they exchange um, their connections with your client and so you get for example six to eight connections to different IPs in the world and the third part is that you want to send and receive bitcoins and this works like um, sending is like creating a transaction and you have to um, broadcast this to all your connected peers and receiving a transaction is like listening to all the new transactions that happen in real time and then you can react with a rental listener on what, whatever you want to know like is there a transaction that is supposed to be for me and how much did they get and so on um, okay, so the ingredients are the public and private keys in the wallet, the connection with the peers, and if you, if you need it, then there is also a storage for the recent transactions. For example, if you want to restart your application, if your application restarts, you can uh, read the storage of past transactions in and don't have to pass the entire blockchain. Maybe we can uh, explain the simplified payment verification. Yeah, I so think there is a, yeah. Okay, yeah. so the, the simplified payment verification is like um, you, you're sending out a transaction and the network propagates all the transactions to all the peers, each one is connected, and then you wait if you get back your own transaction. But, uh, not, not exactly, but okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that the difference why, why this is using up so. Uh, much less resources than the other clients is because it relies uh, on a specific mechanism in the Bitcoin network. So if you have transactions that are <laughs> stating that you will receive money, you cannot assume that this is correct. You have to prove it somehow. 
So um, what is done in the Bitcoin network is uh, with uh, cryptographic algorithms, it is checked if all the other parent transactions which appeared before then were also valid. If you can prove that, then of course you are safe. But to prove that all the parent transactions that are before you are all valid, then you need the whole database. So you don't have the whole database on the Bitcoin J network. So what you are doing is uh, uh, you rely on the miners in the Bitcoin network, with, which provide a huge computational um, computational uh, power uh, that prove that your uh, transactions is correct. So you get a hash value which has a lot of zeros at the front, so this is very hard to calculate. And if you encounter such a block and your transaction is included, then you can assume that, uh, that this was correct, that your money was correctly um, spent to you, so you can spend it afterwards. And uh, this is also the, the, the method of the simplified payment verification because you, don't, you cannot uh, check if a transaction is valid right away but you have to wait for at least one confirmation from the Bitcoin network. For some cases it absolutely makes sense to just assume that any kind of transaction is actually correct. Uh, especially if you get a broadcast from a lot of other nodes, but you cannot rely on uh, broadcasts from other nodes because the Bitcoin network should also be resilient against um, man-in-the-middle attacks. So a man-in-the-middle attack would be uh, you are uh, isolated on the network. If you are in a wireless LAN, somebody hijacks your wireless LAN and routes, routes you through his own network and then he just pretends that you get some money, um, that would be a problem. So. To, to eliminate, eliminate this attack vector, you have this uh, payment verification. In the case of the full client, it's done locally on the machine, but in the case of uh, simplified payment verification, it's done through the network and through the mining. Yeah, exactly. That, that was <laughs> what I was <laughs> just explaining. Okay. That was, yeah. <laughs> so, and that's also what you said it was not. It's not a full um, Bitcoin client, but it needs some other. Um, additional ideas to make it more robust, then it's not fire and forget because you, if, if, I, I don't know what you meant with this, but I guess that the entire blockchain uh, needs to be downloaded once if you want to know all your transactions. Yeah, actually fire and forget is if you set up a, a service, what I meant is if you set up a service using Bitcoin G, you cannot expect that it will run forever without any kind of maintenance. Oh, okay. <laughs> because this, the whole Bitcoin network is still also in, we have to say it in an experimental stage. Uh, it's quite early because uh, um, the software is still also evolving and if there is a protocol upgrade somewhere you have to upgrade your your um, your API so there's no nobody who will take care of a transition an automatic API transition somewhere so you have to update your own software for yourself usually that just means uh, updating the version number in your Maven repository uh, Maven dependencies but maybe you need some uh, some porting work yeah, too. The API could still break too. Yeah, yeah, okay. it, so, it does break. So okay, now the main part of our talk is we want to show you how to actually write the Java um, code. So what we did is to write to, to copy paste some of the snippets and explain them. So the first snippet is this wallet file. So this is just a very simple code that creates this one. And the important part is here that. Okay, what, what this params is, we will explain in, in the next slide, but um, there is a, a constructor for the wallet and you can also save it to a file. And so you, you have support for serialization, you can add your keys with the private keys or just the public keys. And that's everything you need to know with creating your wallet. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the maybe, second maybe we can explain, can you go back to the yeah. slide? Yeah, we, uh, your wallet uh, contains your private keys, so this is very important, you have to take care of it. Yeah. Uh, the file where you store the wallet, it has to be kept secure, because if somebody can read the file, you can, uh, he can read your, um, private keys. your private keys and he can spend your money. So on Android, what you are doing usually is uh, write it in a, uh, just in a private uh, space of your application. So you have to make sure that the, the file you are creating is actually 
um, not readable by, on the SD card, for example. Yeah. Yeah? And uh, what is also important is that in the wallet there is a lot of uh, state information about the blockchain, about the unspent coins. So uh, from time to, you have to make sure that the file is writable all the time. Bitcoin J will write to this file uh, all the time, almost uh, at, on every block that it's uh, receiving. So yeah. Okay. So then this network parameter is so one nice property of the Bitcoin network itself is that there isn't just one network, but also a second one just for testing, and there you can it behaves the same way, it works the same way. But the coins that are spent and received on this network are worth nothing. And so this is very nice to, to have support for this. So the interfaces, network parameters, and just by switching this implementation, you are on a completely different network with different coins. And so you can test it without spending any action money. OK, so this is always this parameter. And the addresses change, and the wallet change, and everything changes. Um, depend on which type of implementation you're choosing there. Okay, so the addresses themselves. So if you want to create an address from a string, then it depends, like you have constructor, and then it depends on the network parameters and the string of the public key, and then you get an address, and this can you can use to send some bitcoins, okay? And the others are like, here is a way to just create a new key, EC stands for elliptic curve, <laughs> and what's the other part of it? Yes. Um, yeah. The, the other part is just uh, so for, it, for it, each key it, you have yeah. actually three parts. Yeah. You have your private key, you have your public key, and then there's the address. The address is usually used for um, making payment requests. So if if he mm -hmm. says, okay, please uh, send me some money, uh, then he will tell me his address. So I can't do anything malicious with this address except uh, for sending him the money and then later on I can confirm that I have actually sent him the money. What you should do usually is for each transaction you are um, doing is create a new address. So you have to create a oh, new I'm private key. We will key. explain this on the next slide. Yeah. Ah, okay. What I want to say here okay. is that the string representation of the address has a one at the beginning and this is indicating that it's on the actual production network. If it has an N, then it is on the testnet. So the the string representation already encodes if it is on, on, on what sort of network it is. Okay, and so the and although the keys themselves are just uh, byte vectors. Okay, and I, I think the, the the slide after this is what you were talking about. Okay, this is then the step to connect to the network. So it is also quite straightforward, like peer group. This is your, your, your group of um, other Bitcoin nodes you're connecting to. And um, yes, like if, if you start it, then um, it tries to connect and does everything on, on its own. Okay? And the reason why you add a wallet is that when you want to listen to events like, did I receive Bitcoins, then it depends on the private keys on the wallet. Okay, so this is then the payment notification. So to this wallet that is um, used, you can add an event listener, and there you have the information what has happened. And I think this is not only the, the, the it's not the only event listener you can have, right? But I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are there are tons of event listeners actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. You so don't need most of them. Yeah, so there is a very large array of use cases where you can use uh, Bitcoin J. So, so there's not a single use case where you say, okay, I want to receive money and I want to spend money, whatever. So, but, but you can introspect actually the whole uh, Bitcoin network, the whole messaging that is going on in the Bitcoin network. You can explore the nodes and, and what, whatever. So what <clears throat> we're focusing here is uh, just... Uh, uh, focusing on money received in this case, uh, on coins received, you, you get a, an, an event fired back to you. But uh, actually, you can also uh, introspect. I will show one example of that uh, uh, where you can count how many nodes are connected to you, for example. Yeah. Okay. This is some, sometimes interesting. And this is the slide. If you want, if you have a transaction, you can say, like, from the transaction, give me the inputs, like, this is the number of. Uh, existing transactions from where the transaction has, has its origin, okay? And uh, um, it gets the first one, 
and then you can go back and see what's the actual address of this. So the address and here the, the value of that has been stored there for the transaction and then utils Bitcoin value to friendly string. This is also already a wrapper for going back from the actual public key representation to this nice string representation. Yeah. And then this is just a note that when you have payment requests, you can have as many addresses as you want. Yeah. So then you can identify each payment with a unique address. And then you know when the payment has been done by the customer. Okay, and this is the way how you send a payment. Um, if you have a wallet and this KO is the two address, then you can just say you know, from the wallet send the coins, depending on the peer group, the two and the value. And if the send result is not null, then you can see that it has worked and the hash string is the unique identifier in the Bitcoin network for the transaction. So the, you, you can use this send coins TX hash string on any public database and have a third party verification that the, that the transaction is actually in the network and later on it is in a block. And this is what you can show to the customer. So what uh, the hash string is usually, it's, it's computed on your local machine, so you generate a, yeah. a unique transaction identifier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we can go back to one slide as well. So uh, I don't know, um, does anyone know what the tx.get inputs uh, actually means? I think this is worth worth explaining to, to understand uh, what what's <laughs> we, actually we, going on. <laughs> we, we are assuming yeah. then that you already know the Bitcoin network. So the primary object in the Bitcoin network is a transaction. And you can think of this like this is an edge in a directed graph. And each node in the graph is a Bitcoin address where, where there can be funds, like here. And to those addresses where you have your private key you can use it as an input for any transaction so like this one goes here like this is 0.1 bitcoin and here you have 1.1 bitcoin and those both you need the private key and then it could be the input and those two addresses with, with those transactions they are emptied and so the total input is uh, plus 1.2, okay? And then on the other side, you can span it to a new address, like an empty one, which is then, let's say, one Bitcoin. And the, then there is some change, like this is the receiver, okay? And then there is some change so that the input equals the output. And the change goes back to an address you also own, and this should be um, 0.2, 0 .2 yeah. Bitcoin, right? So this this but is it is not entirely correct could, because input, there is also a transaction fee. Which uh, this is yeah. just like that because if it, that is 0.1, then the transaction fee is implicit 0.1. Okay. Yeah, but we'll just write 0.1 here and then it's fine. So, so there, you notice that the sum doesn't add up. So you, sp you, you put in 1.2 bitcoins and you just get out 1.1 bitcoin and then implicitly uh, the point one Bitcoin goes automatically to the miner. This is the, the miner is the one that is finding the next block. This is, that's a lottery going on, where you put in a lot of computing power, and eventually you get the point one Bitcoins uh, from this transaction, and also a block reward. Uh, and the block reward is the way money comes into into existence. Because there is uh, at the start of the Bitcoin network there were no Bitcoins actually. So we have to create them somehow, and this is uh, done with the block reward. So if there is uh, a miner mining, uh, doing his thing, and suddenly he finds a block, he can award 50 bitcoins to himself, uh, which is uh, later on it's going to be reduced. So in a few uh, days, actually, the, the block reward will halve back to 25 bitcoins, and then it will halve to 12.5 bitcoins, and so on. So there, there is a geometric uh, rise in the amount of bitcoins, uh, and the, the maximum total will be 21 million. So there will ne never be more than 21 million bitcoins, and these will all they will all flow into these transactions. So you see, unlike traditional banking or any any other kind of, you can actually identify the the coins. Therefore, the, the the word coin is important in the network. You can identify the coins where they are flowing from from which address to which address. You don't know who these people are but you know um, that there's uh, nothing uh, bad going on. Nobody can just 
create money out of thin air because it's um, you can go you back can to the origin of each Bitcoin and yeah. as a as a draw here they, they are also mixed like you send the two addresses then this one is spent somewhere and then they come back after some transactions and you know then so on yeah so so there is a mix of of, of, so, so if you get one Bitcoin, it usually consists of 10 different parts of Bitcoins that have been created in the past one and a half year. <laughs> yeah. And so what usually also happens is that one of these outputs goes back to the original, to the original uh, owner. Yeah. Because this is the change, uh, the yeah. change so address. And, and it could also be the output could be uh, equivalent to the input. So you can also have one that goes all the way back to where the input happened, if if you see this as an address. So, but this is yeah, it's just a nice property. Okay. And all the bitcoins you own is the sum of all the nodes where you have the corresponding private keys. That's okay. why you need a wallet. Okay. I think, we, I think we covered that, that part. Okay, so this is sending a payment. This is just a one-liner, basically, if you have everything set up. And, okay, this was the last slide. Should we show the, yeah. the, the code example? Okay, yeah. this is a oh, real-life oh. code. Uh, real-life. Yeah. So, so real we'll, maybe we'll show <laughs> the application first. So I don't know if it will be visible uh, at the back. So. We were at the hackathon uh, two weeks ago or something, three weeks ago? Two. Two okay. weeks ago, okay. And uh, we, we coded some applications uh, using Bitcoin J, and one of them uh, was a voting application. Yeah. Oh, let's see if it's uh, shut, if it's so, so the idea of the voting application is you have Obama and Romney, and both of them have a receiving Bitcoin address. And if you yeah. send funds to one of them, um, then the counter of the total balance for each of them increases and then you have progress bars for who gets more. Yeah, I will, I will uh, demo it. Okay, so this is the, the code, so what you can see is just like I wrote down. Here is this peer group that has been created and somewhere later some... Oh, I don't know what this is, but here is an event listener and what it does is like um, on each transaction, for here you can see, um, for each output of each transaction it checks if this transaction is important for me and if it is important for me should I increase the value for Obama or Romney. So this is basically this one and this one. So, so add value done, then does the heavy lifting of I think sorting out. And, and adding all the transactions there. So can you see it some at, le at least a little bit in the back? So there are the two pictures of these candidates and uh, each of them has an address. So addresses in the Bitcoin network are uh, very often represented by QR codes. So what you're doing is you, you fire up your wallet on your regular Android phone and you scan the QR code of the of the candidate and to so say, okay, I want to send him some money. Let's see if, if that's working here. Yeah. And uh, I just uh, sent him point, uh, 0.1 Bitcoin, which will push him to, to win the election. Let's see if that's working in the live demo. It's always very, very risky. So I just sent it and uh, maybe this one is going to pick it up and giving uh, instant feedback later on. Um, maybe, <laughs> or it, uh, it's crashing, but, ah, no, I sent it to the wrong guy. I sent it to, <laughs> <laughs> to Romney accidentally. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if you want to support Obama, you can uh, scan this QR code and then it will uh, bump his progress bar uh, further to, um, to win the election. Well, actually, it's already done, so <laughs> there's no point in it. But I thought uh, it's, it's a neat point. So what you, 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 you can do change the, the images to at least Feynman and some of that. Yeah, yeah, we will, we, we, will do a, we will do a Wikipedia crawl and, and pick the next election automatically or something like that. So what you can see here is actually um, 
it's very easy to build interactive uh, applications using money. So this is something that's not very usual. The only uh, situation where we are using that is like televoting uh, in, um, in, in, the, in, like the, on, TV. in the, on TV. Yeah, because but each SMS costs you an additional fee. Yeah. And, uh, and so the, the fee overhead for televoting is enormous because you want to vote with a few cents for a candidate because that's what you're usually paying, uh, but uh, but if the, the the telecom operators take huge fees for that, and uh, they are the the ones that are actually making money besides the TV stations, not the candidates. Ah, now Obama got some money. No. <laughs> so you see the, the the messages on the Bitcoin network. Yeah, it's not instant, not exactly instant. This had had to sh um, this had to. Um, get up some, some connections to the Bitcoin network until it was fully connected. So what, what you want to have sometimes is to connect to an already very well connected node. If you are running on, on a, a mobile device, then you may want to use an external service uh, additionally to your, uh, to your Bitcoin connections or, or maybe you're just uh, running Bitcoin J on a server. Because on the server you can uh, sh uh, you can create lots of connections yeah. and then you just query your own server. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. Okay. So what's the next? Okay, the future of Bitcoin J. So um, full verification capabilities. You probably meant with this that it, it is not just storing the reduced blockchain, but it stores everything in a special database. And related to this, the last point with Bloom filtering because you have to speed this up, the, the database is growing and growing and queries need to be fast. Yeah. yeah, the Bloom filtering is the main purpose of the Bloom filtering is to um, make queries to the, to the Bitcoin network very precisely that you save a lot of bandwidth, that you only get those packets that are actually no, interesting We could to ask you. who doesn't know what the Bloom filter is. Everyone, everyone else. <laughs> okay, yeah, a bloom filter is like a question, um, like um, you're asking a question and this bloom filter gives you the answer either yes, I'm certain, or no, but with a certain probability it could be still yes, or the other way around. So, so you don't have a, a clear yes, no answering, but only in one direction it's clear. And the implementation, the, very, the easiest implementation is like um, you're hashing something or have some specialized hash, and you're just looking if certain bits are flipped to one. And if it is the case, then you answer yes. Otherwise, you answer no, but it could be still yes. Mm -hmm. And then you can have a probabilistic filter with, which breaks the, um, um, like the, yeah, which breaks the, the oh, of, I don't know what the database uh, looks like. Yeah, so, um, you, so for cool. usual database lookup, is uh, a log 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 logarithmic speed, yeah. but the problem, uh, the actual problem is the storage space required. Yeah, 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 so the storage space is linear uh, or linear times the logarithm. And uh, this is a problem with a Bloom filter. You can have extremely small data structures in memory that yeah. are just um, give you very fast answers. So for example, uh, uh, Google Chrome uses it. If you look at your Google Chrome, uh, database on your local machine, you will see a lot of uh, files calling, called Bloom filters that's, that are checking, for example, if you have visited a website and yeah, uh, the, the and cache. So on. Yeah. The, the, the cache okay, so a um, multisig. This is multisignatures is a is a is a more complicated type of transaction, and it means that not all, just one private key is necessary to for for each node to transfer the money, but you need, um, for example, two out of three private keys and this means like um, we have some money earned together and if we want to spend it I have I need his confirmation okay this is one of the ideas yeah. and, and, and the problem is like um, how to get a partially verified transaction which isn't fully trans uh, um, verified to his machine and then verified and then propagated the network and then you can have um, escrowing it's escrowing in um, Treuhand service. Treuhand service yes. so you, you because you need a, a third party to verify the transaction. So you will get uh, this escrowing service built into the transaction network already. And you have API level support for that all also. Mm. Because, uh, and, you, and 
uh, what's interesting is escrowing, it sounds like a legal thing, but actually it's not. In the Bitcoin network, it's uh, just a pl plain mathematics thing. It's checking if all, that, uh, all the signatures are correct. So you don't have to rely on a court to get your money back, you just get your money back. Yeah, yeah. It's easy as that, yeah. <laughs> so external hardware wallets is, is somehow tied to the multi-signature support. Okay, so yeah, yeah. so there, there will be, there is already a, a new hardware device uh, from Slush mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, providing signing of keys in a hardware. So you you get your keys, you maybe make a big paper backup, put it inside uh, your hardware, you fuse, um, you fuse a part of, of this hardware so you, can, um, you cannot extract the keys, but the one thing you can do now is you sign uh, your um, transactions with this hardware. So if, uh, if your wallet gets stolen, you have uh, one more secure component. Then it's also thought that this hardware it will be uh, an, adi an addition to Android hardware, so you can like connect on the USB with that or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a repetition of what we said earlier. So to sum this up, you, um, it, it's your piece of software, and it's not running on a third-party service that's managing all the transactions. And you, but what's also interesting to know is that you don't have to log in or something like that because your private key is already the full authentication you need in this everything that's um, required to create transactions and receive bitcoins. And, and so, so like the consumer experience is, is, is well, the, usually people who are doing bitcoin transactions for the first time are a little bit confused because they don't have to log in anywhere and they don't have to um, sign any like, I agree to those terms of usage but they just automatically have their private keys, they got their bitcoins and they're already sending them without anything else. What? Just give us your money. Yeah? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, so and, 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 and the nice thing is, the reason why you don't need this is, um, um, why you need this in traditional systems is the chargeback. Because the company who is selling something wants to um, counteract to the chargeback from the consumer and then they have like the um, the data of the user and the address and so on. Yeah. It, it went on stand, sent by the computer. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this is no contract and no terms of services to care about. Then we have collected some links, like the talk is open source, if you like this, including the Bitcoin counter uh, uh, ticker at the top right. Um, then our organization in Vienna, then um, this here is the website of the project we were talking about mainly. Then there is a nice article on, on Java World, which is a website about Java. And they also explain how to set this project up. And this Bitcoin wallet, which is the, uh, let's say, primary usage. Okay, is this the last slide? Yes. I think so, yeah. Yes. So, okay, now we have um, 13 minutes for questions. And I've, I don't, I think nobody has no. Posted any questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a question. Okay. <laughs> Why does the European Central Bank make a report about... Uh, That's a good question. <laughs> the European Central Bank just recently issued a 50-page report on Bitcoin, or also on other virtual currencies, but the main... Uh, purpose is Bitcoin because um, it's a concept that they haven't thought about. Uh, the only kind of currencies they are currently facing were uh, other foreign currencies uh, um, and they define foreign uh, fiat currencies as currencies issued by a central government. And so this is the first non-fiat digital currency that they encountered. It's so it's a uh, from their perspective, they don't care about uh, so much about the, the type of transaction and the cryptographic properties and so on. They care about the monetary uh, properties of Bitcoin. And um, the monetary properties of Bitcoin are very much like gold, but you can use it on the internet. And so they fear that 
that Bitcoin or, or that it, this is a fear that is expressed in this document that Bitcoin might attract too many people mm -hmm. as an alternative store of value for uh, for them and if too many people accept Bitcoin it could undermine the local uh, the the, cent the ECB's power to regulate the monetary policies and to inflate the money and so inflation is basically a tax where everyone pays and a few people receive money, namely the central bank receives money in that case. Um, and so they, 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 they express this fear. But on the other hand, you have to say they are also very positive about Bitcoin because it provides a lot of competition to existing payment providers, to existing banks, to transaction networks and so on. So it will spur competition, it will uh, raise the bar for existing uh, companies to match the capabilities like multi-signatures, instant transactions worldwide, almost zero fees and so on. So this will uh, bring competition and this will, uh, this will help the consumers. So this is why they are looking into that. Uh, it's an interesting topic and you also have to uh, make sure, uh, be aware that of course Bitcoin is currently from its market capitalization so small that it does not provide uh, is not any threat to anybody. Yeah, right but, but but there's one thing which is interesting. As far as I know, Bitcoin has the highest exchange rate. The highest what? Exchange rate. I mean, compared to what? To, uh, to all the other fiat currencies. Is, is there one above euro and dollar? <laughs> I mean, like is <laughs> well, there is there a currency where you get ten euros for it? <laughs> Um, well, <laughs> I mean, it has no meaning. I, I that's know, just a matter of 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 mathematics. Yeah, I, I, I know. It's it, it just yeah. it's just a matter of um, where you do, do you place your uh, your comma your your, your comma. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but it's an interesting, funny fact, I think. Yeah. yeah. So as I see at the, at the top right of the slides, one Bitcoin currently is at ten point seven five five oh nine dollars. Yeah. All Bitcoins worth at this exchange rate are about 100 million dollars or something, which is not, sounds much, but isn't much for a currency. Yeah. And the price goes up and down. I think it was at two dollars. It was at 30 dollars in one year. It's yeah. very So the um, um, uh, yeah. yeah. So the question was. In five years, will it be regulated? Or yeah. So I, 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 I think the first point everyone has to know is that the exchange rate is actually just nice, but. Um, the exchange rate doesn't change how it is how it how it works, okay? Yeah. Be because be because if, if you just use it to transfer value over the internet with a very low friction, then you just have one exchange like today. Then you send it, and tomorrow the vendor exchanges it back to its local currency. So yeah. They, they, so, so, so so I, I mean the the exchange rate isn't important, and regulation is hard because. There is no central server, and nobody really. Um, well, the the the, the code is open, mm -hmm. and yes. so you have Let's to. Deal, for example, uh, say okay, that there are some services which you can buy with Bitcoin, uh, servers or something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, it, maybe it's easier with Bitcoin to hide the transaction because it doesn't show up on the code of the yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, sure. But still, you can. I mean, our yeah. our standpoint is that you can still pay taxes if you receive payments in Bitcoin. You just have to do a double booking, and so I think from a legal standpoint, it's okay. Yeah, it's it's actually from it's a legal not regulated, standpoint, but okay. It's very taxes. similar to cash because yeah. if you do a cash transaction today, you have to pay taxes. You have to make sure you follow the laws, etc. So there is no difference uh, when when you pay uh, with bitcoins from a legal perspective. And, and, and you also have to know if you do cash transactions, some uh, companies also in Austria will probably not write down the actual amount they received, but some fake numbers. It could happen. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, in the in, in five to ten years, it is a well-established currency. 
Yeah, well, yeah, that's at, at least it is the poster boy for for some new idea, which will be a little bit better. That's okay. that, that's one of the two. Um, let's say. I I, I think you can you cannot go back, okay, because the, 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 this is a technological new achievement, and you cannot undo any technological change. Because like in five years ago, everyone who was who was doing this said. Well, you need a central authority who confirms that the, this, mon this digital money is, is correct and not counterfeited and the transaction is valid. And now there is no central yeah. point. And that's the interesting new paradigm. Uh, one thing before I think we have something yeah. else as questions, but um, uh, Bitcoin network heavily, heavily relies on calculating vast amounts of hashes. Yeah. And I think. Uh, there was one estimate somewhere I read that the power consumed now for calculating the hashes, now the Bitcoin network is relatively slow, uh, small, I mean, is this 500 gigawatts per hour, mm. gigawatt hours or something, as a very it's large a amount of power consumed. Five, five megawatts is it's today. Yeah. Five and megawatts uh, is today. Let's say the Bitcoin network gets well accepted, everybody uses it, this will yeah. very much grow, you have to like build really nuclear power plants just to yeah. calculate the hashes. No, um, the, also the size so, of the Bitcoin network is... <laughs> the will increase. So there, there are two aspects. Or maybe, or maybe if some distant future the government, uh, the euro is gone and everyone pays with Bitcoins, yeah. the government might have an interest to build its own uh, mining Yeah. Station. So there, there are two aspects. First of all, the five megawatts is the, the power used today. Yeah. This is one... <laughs> building uh, of a bank uh, compared to one block of building of a bank in New York right now. This, so this is not huge world, on a worldwide scale. On the other hand, there is new hardware coming out, A6, which use about 1000, I think, of the power that are used today by graphic cards or even CPUs. So CPUs and graphic cards are the worst and worst environment, environment and where power. you can mine for bitcoins with specialized hardware the power cost goes way down and the initial cost goes up so you have to invest a lot of money up front to build to buy the hardware and to develop the hardware and then the power cost is very low when you are there so this will shift this this notion dramatically and these asics are coming out um, like next month or next year or next year or something <laughs> but the, the FPGAs are already here. I think you had a question too. Yeah. yeah. You said earlier in your talk that there was a maximum amount of Bitcoin that will ever be mined. Uh, yeah. Created. Yeah. And it was about 21 million. Yeah. So, so the first counter argument if this is a problem is like Bitcoins don't have the traditional. Wait for the question. Okay. <laughs> so that's my, my, my question is going that direction. So I've read somewhere, I don't know, that there are some macroeconomic implications to that. That, that they raised concerns that there would be, if we um, imagine a scenario where everybody would be adopting Bitcoin as mm -hmm. their primary currency or whatever, that these, the limited amount of Bitcoins would lead to deflation or something. I was wondering whether you could shed some light on what your point of view on, on uh, the, the, Yeah, the, first of all, um, Bitcoins are divisible <laughs> to eight digits after the comma. So this is not like Bitcoin in bit sense, but it is 100,000 of a Bitcoin. So if everyone wants to have bitcoins, they can have it, but it's just a tiny fraction, but no problem, just shift the comma. And the second one is, yes, there is deflation, but that's just how it works. Either you have inflation and, and, uh, and, and interest rates on a positive amount on your, on your uh, account at the bank, or you have deflation and no interest rates. Mm -hmm. But then, if you just follow that through, doesn't that mean that the people who adopt it right now will become infinitely rich? Yes. Wrong? Yes. <laughs> yes. True. But but they also have the higher risk. If you if you if you're jumping on a bandwagon, everyone is already using, and you're a late adopter, then you're not getting rich. Never. <laughs> isn't that an obstacle to adoption? That you say, well, I'm already late to the game now. No, no, because uh, later on, if you just want to use Bitcoin for a transaction, you can buy it and instantly sell it. 
It will be it the, will the exchange rate doesn't diminish the uh, actual. So is Bitcoin then just a usability. clever scheme for the inventors of Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, oh, of course, yes. Only if it's clever, it's will say it is. <laughs> yeah, there there is this argument, but it's definitely um, not in the not the same direction as a Ponzi scheme. If you are pointing, I, I, I would say that. you have the same argument with the ECB. Because the ECB also creates money or changes the interest rates, and some people in the inner core know this and already can like um, yeah. do some future options yeah. on the dollar and compared to euro. I mean, the, the information is open, so everyone can jump on this bandwagon if he wants to. But the the risk is very high. You risk losing your private keys. You risk being robbed on your computer. You risk of just forgetting about the whole thing. Or you risk that the whole project just will not work out and somebody will crack, I don't know, a security flaw and just destroy the whole network. So there are huge risks. Do you want to take this risk? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> so, yeah, they are, they, the early adopters have the risk and they also paid the price. I mean, I lost also some Bitcoins uh, by just giving my Bitcoins to someone else and they just vanished with them. How is that possible? Yeah, that's possible. I gave them, I, I just uh, said, okay, I have a, an, an online account at your site and I give you my Bitcoins and you guarantee that you will give them back to me if I request them in the future. And then the site just went offline. Just like a bank. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't give them all of my Bitcoins, but a, a, tiny, a, a small amount, but still, that hurt. Yeah, you, the the yeah. point is you want to have access to your Bitcoins while you are on the, on the go. And one year ago, it was like, put this on the website and then... You can have it everywhere you, where you have your laptop. Or, or if you want to do uh, margin trading with Bitcoins, for example, that's, then you have to put in your money on the site. But there are actually there are solutions for that with multi-signature, but they are in the future. So yeah, in, in a few years, we will see these kind of services emerging um, with a very high security standard for the users, where it's impossible for the service to steal your money too. But this is still in the future. Yes, but you I don't need them. Yeah, actually. I mean, for, first of all, you don't need them, and second of all, I think they have already looked into it, and they don't offer it, so they said no. Probably PayPal is very happy with them. Yeah. 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 Say if I want to change bitcoins in euros, how does it, this work? Is, is there a special service where I just send bitcoins and then they transfer money to my account, or the whole yeah. structure? Yeah. So um, there are multiple services. Um, to to get bitcoins, you have to find someone who has bitcoins. And usually in the classic world, this is just done on an exchange, uh, like in the real world. And then you can... Uh, so, so real world yeah. is localbitcoins.com? Yeah, this is one possibility. But the actual... So local bitcoins is where you, where you find someone locally to you who is exchanging that. But the, the real volume is occurring on the exchanges like this is the exchange Bitstamp, which is located in Slovenia. And the biggest exchange in the world is Mount Gox, which is located in Japan. And they have a volume of a few million dollars per month. And... Uh, they, uh, yeah. So you can you can exchange quite a, quite an amount of money there, if you want to. So they, they are uh, matching buyers and sellers for for Bitcoin. So if if I want to sell Bitcoins, I, I send them there, and I hope they don't vanish with them. So that's the risk here. Uh, and if I want to buy them, <coughs> I, I buy Bitcoins, I send them uh, fiat money, euros, dollars, whatever, and then I can put in limit orders, market orders, whatever, and then I and get, get it back. Right. And this is usually, the, 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 the hard part of that is actually sending the money there. So <laughs> an international transfer takes time. If you use uh, local Bitcoins, you can get it almost instantly. You just meet with the person who has already Bitcoins. And on Bitstamp, you can use a SEPA transfer within one day. So it's, uh, they have uh, fast European transfers. Therefore, I use uh, Bitstamp, for example, the second Biggest exchange, yeah. I think, or the, the third biggest the exchange. It's the best one for, for us here. Uh, if you're in Russia, you would use uh, btc-e.com, or if you want to play arbitrage games, then you can play all of them at once. <laughs>
Okay, yes. a question. Uh, is there a business case behind Bitcoin Austria? No, definitely. It's not profit. So it's, we just uh, want to inform people. And uh, it's a very interesting hobby to have. Yeah, I mean, the business case is, well, if you have your own private project or doing some other business, then you have interest to also inform people. But the organization itself is a regular non-profit um, um, Verein, so yeah. governed by the Austrian law, <laughs> nothing, nothing special. And very cheap fees for the year, for, for the yearly membership. Yeah, if you want to be a member, you <laughs> just have to provide, I think, two bitcoins yeah. for free. <laughs> yeah. To cover the hosting and domain name, basically. I have a question about the limit with 21 million bitcoins. Uh, this is because of the rule uh, that every four years the uh, new bitcoins are halved, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But isn't it that this rule is decided by the miners? Yeah, yes. it is. So they could change this rule? Yes. If they want to, yes. But it's a majority it's, vote. It's not a mathematical fixed rule. Uh, or so. It so it's like well, well, the ECB who says, yeah. let's inflate mm -hmm. a little bit. So it's more democratic of, uh, uh, than the ECB. I, I, I would say it's not democratic, it's just who has more money and more power decides. And the majority who are mining just believe in those rules. And there could be like a, a new branch where, it, where there is no limit, for example. You just It could be a fork. I mean, it, it, it's it, a danger. You, you have to be a little bit careful because you know, there are just 64 bits in a long, long, I think, in C, so you have to like, take care of the overflow, but um, then there have two branches, and then there's Bitcoin 1, which is the traditional one, and Bitcoin 2, which, is, which has the new rules, and they are incompatible. So this could happen. You can do it on your own. But it's a, also a game theory question, because yeah. uh, the, the miners have an incentive to keep mining. They have hardware investment. They want to keep the Bitcoin network alive and collect these transaction fees. Mm. That's the long-term incentive because the, the reward is going to zero, almost zero. Uh, I mean, in about a hundred years, it's actually zero. But uh, until uh, and in this time, they, they they have to make sure that people are actually using the Bitcoin network. Their transaction amount gets yeah, up. And, the, and, the fees and if you change the rules on the fly, then. Most of the people yeah. will jump off because then they say, well, you say there are rules, I invested in this and now you change it, this is a mess. Mm -hmm. So it's more like that everyone decides this rule and not only the miners because the miners are... Well, the miners are right. who decides this yeah. in, on a technical level. Yeah. But, but of course the, 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 the reason why the miners are all, all deciding the same is there is an open source software which everyone is running and there of course are forks and modifications on it but it's doubtful that people who are modifying it will also modify this part of the code where the, the money creation is occurring because if they modify it their blocks will not be accepted by the majority. So you have to have a majority of the of the voting power, of the mining power um, in the hardware investment that you actually can pull this through if you want to. Yeah. So, but yeah, or yeah. For you have to work, yeah. And you mentioned the transaction fee, which is uh, dot one uh, bitcoins or yeah. something. Yeah, that's that's uh, not the actual amount. The actual amount right now is zero point zero 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 five. Or zero. You can also you can also say it. no fee. And yeah. how is it calculated? Because when the money deflates, so to say, yeah. then well, it, 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 it this is this is also a matter how the miners implement their verification software, because they are those who say which of those transactions are actually included in the new block, which is up to be mined. And if they say no, I don't take transactions with zero transaction fee then those transactions just need longer to be verified or get lost sometimes because then they are in, starting to be invalid. Okay, So this is also a majority vote and if, if you include a transaction fee which is like the standard, which is five, ten thousands or something like that, then you're almost certain you will be in the next block. If you say zero, it could happen that two or three blocks go by without including the transaction. So this is right now. And in the future, it will be a little bit harder. Okay, we have to stop, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah.
We, we started ten, five minutes late. Seven, seven and minutes ago. So yeah, no, we, we, we also started more than seven minutes late. Okay, yeah. so there are some refreshments outside again. And the next talk should start in three minutes. Uh, two minutes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.